Welcome everyone to this important webinar on uh, revisioning education for regenerative learning. Uh, for this, we have uh, three, I must say, senior and uh, um, seasoned educationists uh, uh, who's going to share with us uh, uh, their experiences on this important topic. Um, so the first one is, uh, we have Dr. Thakur Singh Paudil, our former education minister who is based in Thimphu, Bhutan. Uh, and uh, we have Dr. David Fulton, who's based in Colorado, and Dr. Craig, who's based in Hawaii. Of course, uh, our, uh, my co-host, Am Dolma, will make a detailed introduction later. Uh, but I would like to welcome uh, all our viewers uh, to this important uh, webinar. Uh, so this is the fourth and the final in a series of four webinars that we have organized as a part of the uh, International Society for Teacher Education Seminar, uh, which we are going to host uh, here at Paro College of Education uh, face to face uh, in June. Uh, we are expecting uh, 100 plus participants uh, will come here from around the world uh, to further deliberate on uh, important educational uh, topics. Um, so uh, these webinars have been really important uh, for us as organize of, uh, organizers of this ST seminar. Uh, beyond deliberation on these important topics, uh, this has really helped uh, us to introduce ST to some new members so we are looking forward to this face-to-face -face seminar uh, in June. Uh, so with that uh, brief uh, uh, introduction, I would like to welcome everybody once again, and uh, thank you for your time. And over to you, I'm Dolma, uh, my co-host. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kassan. Uh, aloha from Hawaii to everyone. Um, thank you again for joining us today. And before uh, we start a session, I would like to invite everyone who has been with us for every session to do a reflection how we start the journey of this webinar that first we invited our community elders and gave us some messages from what is education about from elders vision for future generation. Those are elders that uh, host indigenous culture wisdom and they know their culture and their kids, their environment, their community, they care uh, the future of Earth deeply. And after that, we had Dr. To, who is moving the Happy School Movement globally and gave us a gene age based concept and the principle and practice of Happy School that is being uh, welcomed by many countries and many schools, especially successfully being running in Vietnam. And then as we all, we know that the foundation for Happy School was mindfulness. We had Dr. Joe Levis um, and Michelle from Hawaii who their life work was on mindfulness practice and shared with us all kinds of possibilities and aspects. And then, Today, we at the end of the um, journey of the online webinar, and we have Dr. Podio and Dr. Craig, Dr. David, who are deep um, engaged educators and nurturers and cares in the education sectors in their own dimension and realm. And so um, it's an invitation for all of us actually just to relax and just to think the best vision you could have for your own children, for yourself as an educator and for our earth. It's really a co-creating session, although they are mainly talking, but they are inspired as I know them personally. And uh, I'm sure you all read their uh, extensive bios and Dr. Paudio especially was the founder for the Happy School Movement, Green School Principle, and which his book already translated into 18, 19 lang different languages. His, his dream is to turn all school into green in and out in all dimensions. And I always say, he, you know, beside all his achievement, to me personally, he's like a mirror 
useful educators on earth. I would, if you want to know, I would say, we come to him and say, mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the best educator in the world? <laughs> he will say, it's you. And then you will feel maybe, oh, I'm not sure if that's true. And then he will find a way to show you, you are truly the best version you have not met. And just be near him, listen to, talk to him. You, you will be nearly getting enlightened and fighting the best version of yourself ever. And you will thrive to be the best educator on earth. So I think today by listening, he's sharing his wisdom. I hope everyone would meet the best version of ourselves. Um, and of course, Dr. David, um, who just cares everyone's development in, in education. And he's someone who would take a vacation and then and accidentally walks in a school and he forgot he was actually vacation and he would start supporting the movement of a school, whatever activity happens, that's how much he cares. <laughs> and so to him, education is boundless and there's no boundary, no, you know, no, no age. And so he's he's gonna share some deep practice he has how he has nurtured the school, the children, the teachers. And Dr. Craig, uh, I call him the gardener of uh, the Garden of Eden. Uh, he, he has talents in many ways, but last 30 years, he has just been deeply working to manifest a green school for everyone in life from backyard of mom's kitchen or to a school campus, or to a large farm, or to the vision of the earth, and and he he he's he's been working with the elders in different indigenous communities who hold secrets about human relationship with nature for four thousand years old wisdom, and which he will share with us. I'm sure his perspective. Will, will inspire us or nurture some seeds that have been sleeping for ages. And I, I hope uh, today's session will just inspire everyone, nurture everyone. And, and I, I wish this will bring all of us a very um, fruitful the rest of the year and the trip to Bhutan, the ones who are coming to Bhutan and we can meet to uh, further discuss uh, our topics. And before I invite Dr. Craig to talk first, we would like to just to uh, uh, take a few questions with everyone, just to set our guide everyone's mind into the realm we would like to invite you in. So you can click, choose from your own screen. All right. Did everyone fill up the poll? Okay, let's have a look how is everyone today? As a child, how often did you feel deeply connected to nature? Wow, constantly, each breath in the first. We got a we, we got a good crowd. <laughs> As a doubt, how often do you feel deeply connected to nature? That's wonderful. What are your most important source of nourishment? We, we have very balanced analysis here. 
we have no coffee drinker. <laughs> 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 what percentage organically grow and source locally? Wow. Thank you for everyone's answer. This is uh, very um, inspiring. All right, now we um, invite Dr. Craig uh, to share his uh, messages, wisdom, stories with us today. Okay, thank you so much. Kuzo um, Zambola, aloha everyone. Uh, I feel very privileged to be um, speaking today and uh, to be uh, presenting um, with my esteemed co-presenters. Um, I would like to share a bit about what I've learned about reconnecting with nature through the act of regenerating nature itself. And through that process, regenerating ourselves Sorry, one moment. Sorry, one moment. Sorry, one moment. Is this visible to everyone? Yes, great. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, so I'm going to be talking about regeneration in, in, in kind of a broad perspective, but mainly through the lens of how we interact with nature through agriculture. And so we're, we're very fortunate in the world to have um, some areas where agriculture is still a regenerative system. And this is an example from Samoa that I show very frequently. This is a food system that is very similar to what people have been growing in Samoa and around the world uh, for, for millennia. And it, it looks like a natural forest. It has many of the characteristics, the the species density, the, the different layers, so the structure of a natural forest, but all of them were placed there by humans and they grow harmoniously because um, the way they're planted is consistent with how a, the place and the way that these plants grow naturally in their natural environment. And so this type of regenerative system by regenerative, we mean conditions improve over time. Conditions are continually improving. The soil's improving. The biodiversity is improving. The resiliency to disturbances is improving. So this is an example we can look to. We don't have to imagine a better world which is regenerative, but we have examples right now in the world that are that, that you can go and experience. And that's what I've been very fortunate to do in my career. And the people who actually have the deep knowledge of how to interact in this regenerative way are, are people who maintain their indigenous traditions. And I wanna talk about that a little bit. These are just a few of the people I've learned from in, in my career. All of these um, people have generations of knowledge about how to how to farm, how to interact with nature in a harmonious way. And it's, it's something that is passed on from generation to generation in stories, in language, in experience, in protocols. And so it, it's woven into the culture and the ways of being. And one thing you will notice, and you've probably noticed, is when you're when you're hanging around farmers like these, they don't, they don't talk a lot. 
they're not like me going around trying to teach people about this stuff. Um, they're very quiet. They just do it. They they have the knowledge and they have the experience to just be in nature and interact and and uh, and farm and grow things, but they're not uh, shouting to the rooftops from the rooftop, so to speak. And so you won't actually find people like this in our higher education system, um, which is very unfortunate because these are these are the true experts. These are the ones who who hold deep knowledge and wisdom about how to interact with nature. And so I just want to show you an example of um, that I've experienced. There there are many around the world that still exist. This is the island of Upolu in Samoa, and it is a green island, as you can see from the satellite image. Um, and people live all around the, the perimeter, the coast of the island. And some people live inland as well, but mainly the inland is used for food forests and for preserving native forests. So the upland areas are native forests that are preserved and healthy. And you can also see here the nice blue water, the light blue, uh, coastal areas are sandy and reef uh, areas. That's also healthy. So for 3,000 pe years, people have lived here and they've been growing their food and their medicine and their fiber and everything they need. And as you fly into the capital city of Samoa, Apia, um, you can see all the homes and surrounded surrounding the homes are these biodiverse food forests. These are forest-like systems in their density and diversity. So they function like natural forests, but they also provide the things that we need to eat and other materials that we want. And, and so, and as you go into the city, this is from the balcony at a, um, at a house that me and my colleagues stayed at, an Airbnb, uh, this was 2019. Right outside the window, you can experience again the food forest that all the cities have within them these food forests. And what you don't see in this image is that there are people who who spend time in the forest. You can hear them talking, you can hear children playing, and people go there, harvest food for the day to uh, relax, to maintain the food forest, to do many things. So this is part of their life. It's, it's, a, it's a lifestyle, you might say. In our modern lingo, it's a lifestyle. Um, and so I had the opportunity last time I was in Samoa to ask a group of traditional leaders, uh, politicians, farmers, um, leaders of NGOs and so forth, why do they still have, how were they able to keep this regenerative abundance system going for all this time, 3000 years? And they had many answers, and I'm sure you can think of many uh, reasons why they would do this. But the main reason that, that stuck with me was, it's because this is who we are. This is our culture. This is our food. This is if we lose this, we lose who we are. So it's, it's, it's a part of who we are as human beings to, to interact with nature in a way that, that represents who we are. So I, I've always said, and people don't particularly like this maybe, is that our outside environment, the environment that we impact, is a mirror of our inside environment. It mirrors our values. It's an expression of our values. And in many ways, because we make lots of decisions in life, big and small, our impact on the natural world is a reflection of who we are. And I've learned from Dorma and others about the law of nourishment. And as, um, as Robert Thurman says, Americans don't really like laws of this and that. So he calls them the fun, friendly facts of nourishment, um, that the natural world is what nourishes us. 
it nourishes us through what we eat, consume, it nourishes us in the beauty of nature, it nourishes us in the sounds of nature. You might hear the birds that live in our food forest here. And so the outer world is our nourishment. So the Samoans have chosen a, a, a very broad way of, um, of nourishing themselves by protecting their productive, abundant, regenerative food forests. So what happened to the rest of us? I, I grew up in California, which um, used to be also a green place, a natural forest, and, uh, and was regenerative. But even as I was growing up, it was degenerating. Uh, in that the forest was being removed, uh, urban areas uh, were uh, developed, um, the, the orchards were cut down and replaced with commercial properties and so forth. And so we've gone through this process in much of the world of removing the food forests. And so what happened in this process? What, what, how, did, how did this happen? So I want to present the uh, the reality of most, most places in the world is that over the past 200 or so years, plantation agriculture and, and economic development have had a huge impact on our environment. And so what happened in, uh, in for example, Hawaii and many other islands of the Pacific besides Hawaii was that plantation agriculture replace those food forests, that landscape on, a, uh, on an ecosystem level of regenerative uh, productive forests with plantation crops. And the, the thing about plantation crops is that you lose the regenerative effect. You lose many of the things that we value deeply in life. And so um, this was documented very clearly. Um, this is one example. Uh, uh, of, from a botanist, a, Brit a British botanist who was traveling with Captain Vancouver in the late 1700s, documenting field systems, agriculture throughout the, throughout the Pacific region. And where we're sitting here, right here in Kona, Hawaii, he walked through these fields and he recorded what had happened, what was happening here. And so you can see from this quote, he, he documented that these were incredibly abundant food systems and very di diverse. And then in this, in this moment in time when plantation agriculture was beginning to take over, he, in the next chapter, he talks about essentially, these are great farmers, they know how to grow crops. Let's put them to work for the benefit of humanity. That was his perspective. And so plantation agriculture came to Hawaii it came to this place, it came to all the agricultural corners of, of Hawaii and also many, many, many other places in the world. And so we're left with a legacy. This is an extreme example, but this represents what's happening to all Hawaiian islands and many places all throughout the world. I'll show you a little bit of statistics shortly. This is an island that just like Upolu Island that I showed you in Samoa, was a green island with people living all around. And it was put into sugarcane uh, 120 years ago or so. Uh, when sugarcane was uh, left the island, then pineapples were grown. When pineapples left, it became abandoned essentially as a windswept desert island. And so when we do this, we lose all those values, the, 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 the nourishment of nature the daily connection to nature, all of those things disappear. And we have this monoculture mindset. So that's, that's actually in the mind. And I've, I've, I've put on, I think over 300 workshops in the last 30 years. And it's, it's amazing how the idea of just growing single crop systems has entered into the minds. And it's the way we envision in the modern world, how, how crops should be grown. If you ask a Samoan how a breadfruit tree grows, the picture is always with its companions, with its, 
with the rest of the food forest. The, the, the breadfruit tree is not a loner. It grows in community. And so uh, this is an example of breadfruit that was recently put into commercial production in a monoculture. And I just wanted to point out that when we do that, we enter a degenerative spiral, which we believe in our, we, we actually have convinced ourselves that the only way to keep these growing is by adding things ourselves. We have to add fertilizer, we have to add water when it's dry, and then we have to kill everything that's not the crop that we want. So this is the model that has entered our mindset. And this is a degenerative model, which means things get worse every year. We go from an abundance, a phase of abundance to a phase of degradation. And this is what's happening around the world. Um, and uh, I, I'm going to I'll come back to those slides perhaps, but so just to look at a little bit of um, some of the numbers, uh, about 30, over 30% 30 of human uh, uh, fossil fuel use goes towards agriculture. That's the production, distribution, and processing of our food. Over 30% of greenhouse gases come from our food system, which means that the food system itself is beginning to undermine its ability to work because as climate change happens and more severe weather is hitting all around the world, weather extremes, um, the, our ability to grow food is diminishing. Um, most agricultural land is affected by soil de degradation because of the way we do, have been doing it for the last, especially the last uh, 80 years since um, World War II. Um, millions of hectares are lost to, to desert every year. And, uh, and I'll just end with uh, chemical pollution from agriculture is affecting all life forms, not only on land, but in the ocean, because our, we are producing so much chemical inputs in our agriculture that uh, it's affecting everything. One um, statistic that I wanted to just point out, there's many like this, 80% of adults and 87% of children who were tested had detectable levels of uh, the most common herbicide in their bodies. And that, uh, that herbicide glyphosate has been shown in many studies to have uh, harmful effects in the long term. Um, there's, there's controversy about that, but uh, in general, what's happened is that there's very few studies even. Nobody wants to study the effects of these toxic chemicals on, on humans, especially children. And if you really want to make yourself sad sometime, you can go to this website. Um, this is showing how much degradation is happening in the world right now. It's, these are counters that are live on the website. So. So far this year, 10 and a half million hectares of, of forest has been cut down or burned on earth. Um, 16 billion tons of carbon dioxide has been spewed into the atmosphere just so far this year. And almost $3 trillion have been spent on chemical inputs to agriculture. So this is, this is the effect we're having collectively on the planet. And if we look at how much of our renewable resources we're using, um, this is another uh, fun website to go, <laughs> go to if you want to be the best. So what this means is at the top, we have the United States. The United States, if all people lived like we do in the United States, um, we would be consuming five times the amount of renewable resources produced by the earth or generated by the ecosystem every year. Australia, 4.1 earths and so on. So we are way beyond sustainability in terms of, um, in terms of our effect on the planet right now. And so what, what have we lost with the disappearance of our food for us? We've lost abundant, readily available food. When people come here to our food forest, one of the great uh, reliefs in life is to be around a place where there's lots of food growing 
and it is not dependent upon any sort of input. It's just it's just something that we live with, and it's a good feeling to have that. Um, we lost our source of natural medicines, our food security, this sense of connection to nature, connection to the healthy microbiome. So more and more studies are showing that the microbiome of the environment we live in, that is the microbes that live in the soil, that live on the plants, that are in the air around us, they affect our own microbiome in a very positive way. And so um, by separating ourselves from this, we're separating ourselves from the health of nature, from our connection to nature, which is not only it's a physical connection, it's a biological connection, it's a, it's a, um, it's a connection on so many different levels. And we've also lost, this is a point I want to make particularly for this webinar, that the environment around us as a food for us is our classroom for learning how to interact with nature, just learning what happens in nature, learning about the diversity of nature and the rhythms over time in nature. The, the space where we live is our classroom. So <clears throat> we've changed that classroom into something that's teaching us um, disconnection. disconnection. And so we have new priorities. This is very prevalent around the world that, I, that I've seen and I think many people have seen that our new priorities are to kind of break free from economic development being number one to all, all kinds of other priorities. And also this idea of sustainability, which simply means to maintain the status and not get worse. Maintaining what we have is not good enough. Everything we do has to improve things over time. So regeneration is the new purpose of what we do, which improves things continually over time. That's what we need to be doing, whatever, whatever we do, whether it's, whether it's agriculture, whether it's working with uh, people, our community, everything. I'm, I'm coming towards the end of my, my talk. Um, and, and so what I do mainly in my teaching is show people how to, how to realize um, regenerative outcomes. And these are the regenerative outcomes that are agreed upon common throughout the world that people talk about nowadays. Um, and they have to do with building soil, as I said, about optimizing our water retention. So when it rains, we don't want water sheeting off and, and running away and er eroding our soils. We wanna hold on to water. Um, enhancing biodiversity, continually enhancing biodiversity, which is one of the great strengths of our ecosystems, which imparts this characteristic of resiliency and self-renewal. So we wanna support the renewal capacity of our ecosystems when there's a disturbance, which could be it's extreme weather or something that we do, or it could be fire, uh, whatever it is. We want our ecosystems to bounce back. And finally, uh, we wanna sequester carbon, which is another way to put that is, we want to hold on to organic matter. We want uh, essentially to, to grow plants, to grow woody plants. We want to, that's carbon from the atmosphere down, down in our soil. And we want, that will help us build soil. And actually, if you, want to, um, if you want to be regenerative in your agricultural activities, you have to do all of these. These are all interconnected and linked. You could see these five points as just five different ways to, to, to measure or to evaluate your regenerative outcomes. And so when we do that, we get back in a regenerative spir spiral. And nature nature's always in a regenerative uh, mode. Nature, whatever, whenever we disturb land, nature will come back to regenerate. Actually, we're the problem by disturbing land in harmful ways over and over again with poison, with tilling, 
with uh, many different uh, destructive methods that we use. So um, we want to we want to help nature do what it wants to do, which is regenerate. So if you would like to uh, begin a food forest, you might opt to do something very small. This is it's a little bit hard to see, but these are container grown food forests. These are uh, wine barrels that were cut in half. So they're, um, they're about 100 liter barrels. And in each of these, you can grow a full on biodiverse regenerative food forest wherever you are. This is a very easy way to get going. And in this process, you will learn many things about nature. The beauty of doing it this way is you can do it right outside where you live. So you visit it every day. And that's the way you learn how things change, uh, how the dynamics of nature, and that's the education. Or you can do it uh, on a larger patch. We have several patches like this at our farm. Um, this is a four month old patch. And at one year, it looks like this, and it looks about like this now. So there's, there's this um, experience of learning how things regenerate wherever you are that you can actually participate in. And that's what I, I recommend first, doing it yourself, getting that experience and learning so that you can actually um, share with others what you've learned. So thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Craig. So this is just a very small part of Dr. Craig, what he has he could share with us because of time limit. And I, went, I once asked Dr. Craig, how can we stop climate change with food for regenerative food forest? Uh, he said, he did a good quick um, calculation. And, and, and then he said, if we grow 800 million food forest, home garden, not even larger farm, let's just say if we invite 800 million moms globally or teachers, schools to do a food forest. And then uh, within five to 10 years, we can rebalance everything we have done. And then everyone's, you know, solve the, and we list out all the 17 sustainable development goal was brought out by UN in 2010, which never, none of them is met by now. Food forest system actually meets more than the 17. More importantly to me, I've learned three years, over three years with him, I think is a change of perspective. It really deepens our understanding of holistic vision of what is our relationship with nature is about truly. And if we have children to grow up with such abundance and such beauty, and they will, they will not grow up, go out, poison the earth and cut down forests and do things. They will treat nature as part of their life. And so it, it, this message, I feel it's very, very important for our conference coming up in Bhutan because we wanna talk about transformative, what kind of world we want to live in. It depends on what, education method we're using to facilitate that. What we teach, they become. And so luckily we have all these gurus with us and the modeling. So I would like to invite Dr. Paul Dio, whose visions everyone has a green school from somewhere backyard to classroom to school. And so he will tell us how can we reach this regenerative green school for everyone. Thank you, Dr. Pauli. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Chris Zangpu from Bhutan. To all of you, my fellow edu educators, wherever you are in Bhutan and around the world. Today is a very special day in Bhutan. It's the beginning of the month long no meat um, period. Yes, yeah, so for the next uh, one month, uh, meat consumption is supposed to be avoided. Uh, so it's a very auspicious month for us. Uh, whatever we do is um, supposed to be very virtuous and blessed. Um, and uh, also the beginning of um, 
a very special um, season. And um, what a good idea that we should be meeting like this from across the world and talk about education, talk about life, talk about um, human and natural flourishing. I think uh, the majority of um, the participants today would be from the education sector. And as an educator myself, a teacher myself, to all of you fellow educators at home and around the world, I would like to say how brave and courageous people you all have been. I know that uh, at that moment of truth, at that moment of truth, when you opted to dedicate your life to the well-being of children and youth, wherever it is in the world, you made a most important decision. You could have been doing anything more lucrative perhaps, much more glamorous, much more attractive, and perhaps a lot more comfortable. But you kept all those aside and chose to take up the most difficult mission in the world. For me, education is a mission. Amdolma was most generous with her introduction to me. But um, I'm an ordinary mortal educator by choice. And um, I would like to believe uh, a member of the noble sector. I call education the noble sector. Perhaps um, it is this nobility that um, we have lost in education. And when we talk about regeneration, I think we have to bring back this nobility, this grace, this beauty to education, this love, this compassion, this care. The language of education has changed and changed not for the better. Today we use the language of the market, corporations, companies, commercial institutions. And I think that's a very poor reflection of education and what we've done. I think it was in the fitness of things that we began with um, this wonderful presentation by Dr. Craig, talking about nature and our relationship with Mother Nature and the cost that um, we've had to bear because of our negligence, irresponsibility, and mindlessness. Dr. Craig's talk, presentation, second time I've been, yes, um, following this, came to me as a kind of a reprimand. Reprimand, I've been an educator, and so many of you have been in education as well over many years. And some perhaps are just beginning. But to me, having been in the field for over 35 years, listening to Dr. Craig made me feel uh, and ask myself, what did I do over the last 35 years? We built schools, colleges, universities around the world. What did we do with our schools, with our colleges, with our universities? A decade, two decades, three decades, four decades of engagement with education. Did the world become a better place? Is our mother earth a little more healthy? Is the human lot a little better off? Is there more peace in the world, greater harmony, enhanced trust? Where are we today? Where is the world going? See? What is the state of the world? See? 
Why should there be so much of poverty, so much of um, degradation of our natural environment, conflicts imposed by human beings on other human beings, wars unleashed by nations on other nations, human beings, the human of the species, supposed to be the most highly evolved of all beings. Where are we? Where is our humanities? Where are those temples of learning? Our schools, colleges, and uh, universities. Where are we? That's why today, when I look back at our own um, gift that we have received, from His Majesty, the fourth King of Bhutan, Dugyalpo Jingmi Singh who we revere as the King of Destiny. I think there was such a far-sighted, powerful call to do just as Dr. Creek presented to us. Take care of Mother Nature and Mother Nature will take care of us. The soil on which we walk, the earth on which we walk, the soil in which our food grows, the air that we breathe, the water that we drink, the vegetation, the plants that give us oxygen. The abundance of Mother Nature, which we are so dependent upon. What is our relationship with Mother Nature? That's why today when we talk about global warming, climate change, I believe um, we have to ask ourselves, what is our role in that globalization, in that climate change, in the heating of the earth? The sinking of low-lying islands, the melting of um, the mountain snows, desertification of our lands, drying up of water sources, pollution of the airs, the sea, the land, and the sky have not been spared. But as a teacher, I'm also a man of faith and of hope. I believe together we can make a difference. And if, we, if education cannot make a difference, I believe nothing else will. Education is about hope, is about faith. There's so much of cynicism in the world, negative energies. We have to expand the scope of goodwill positive energy and faith. Otherwise, I feel that um, it is not really necessary to build schools, colleges and universities and collect the largest number of the most precious segment of the population are children, boys and girls, young men and women, and keep them in our institutions for extended periods of time, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, when they are there, in the most precious phase of their life, in the most formative phase of their life, oughtn't something more purposeful, more worthwhile, and much more fulfilling, excuse me, be happening in our schools, excuse me, colleges and universities, institutions of learning. I feel that is only fair is only right, is only just that there are children, a young men and women, boys and girls, our scholars receive what we owe them. And what we owe them is not only the sharpening of brains and skills, but building the building of faith and of character and hope. The world is not a perfect place, but with all its imperfections, 
it is still a good world. And this is the only world we have. This is the only world we have. And it deserves our care. It deserves our love and compassion. It deserves our goodwills. And I think uh, we can make a difference. And teachers, uh, wherever you are, my fellow educators, I think um, every moment, every moment, you are making a difference. The moment you come to your class in the morning, and teach a child a new sound. The world is no longer the same. It will have become different. The moment you teach a child a new concept, a new meaning, a new word, the world is no longer the same. So every moment you're making a difference, the world becomes better. Even though there are so many other factors and obstacles, pressures that um, you have to deal with all the time, see. However, in your own quiet ways, you're making a beautiful difference. So in fact, um, just as uh, Dr. Tig has um, this very powerful, all-embracing vision of um, natural regeneration for the regeneration of life, I believe that uh, we have to regenerate the promise of education, the noble sector. That's why in my own vision of education that I have represented in my green school, Amjamyang made a reference, reference to that. You know, some of you might know that um, in Bhutan, we have this um, special blessing of um, a unique vision of development gifted to us by His Majesty the Fourth King, Dugyalpa Jigme Singh of Wonchuk. We call it Gross National Happiness. This is um, exactly um, a new pathway to regenerate, regenerate Mother Earth regenerate the goodness of life, the preciousness of life, as opposed to a GDP-led development path. Our young king looked around and saw that countries around the world looked at development or progress from this highly limited industrial utilitarian vision of GDP. That does what exactly Dr. Craig showed by way of deforestation, plantation model of production, see, as opposed to model of regeneration. His Majesty believed that um, we have to take care of the soil, the plants, the animals, the birds, all life forms, because we, the human of the species, are just a small microcosm of the large macrocosm of which we are just a little part. See. So to claim that we are the masters of the universe and we can exploit mother nature is such an irreversible, thoughtless and mindless approach and attitude to life. See. And the world is in the state in which it is now simply because of this exploitative GDP led model of production in consumption that we often call development and progress. What a distorted view of development. You cut down the trees, mine the oceans, release poisonous gases into the atmosphere, just in the name of gaining more profit. And that we still call development, still call progress. And millions are dying, see. And the children, children, suffering by consumption of um, chemicals which come from our food, see, as Dr. Craig showed so clearly. See. So that's why in my own, uh, my prayer, my prayer, my hope is that we are able to 
of rethink education, transform educational thinking. See. There's so much of talk about education all over the world now, see. Everybody's talking about education, but not everything that goes on in the name of education is education, see. So much of it is miseducation, see. And that is the, that's what is actually making the world so messy that it is today, see. With the, with the number of schools and colleges and universities and the number of highly educated people that we have in these institutions, the world ought to be better, see. A little more united, a little more harmonious, a little more peaceful. Our societies, our countries, our regions, our world, despite the United Nations Organization, despite the big, big um, agencies, with all the most highly qualified people, investing huge amounts of resources, what have we got? See? It's about time, it's about time that we looked at education from fresh eyes. That's why it is such a beautiful coincidence that um, my green school begins with them, honoring Mother Nature, see? natural greenery. Natural greenery has got to do with them. Our ability to appreciate this most precious link between us, the human and the species, and all the elements of Mother Nature. It is important to keep our senses open. The eyes that see, the eyes that see. What do we see? see? Do, our eyes, do our eyes see the beauty of our natural environment? And when we see the beauty of our natural environment, what kind of impact is there on our eyes and thereby on our minds? See? The eyes that, that, that see, the objects that, um, that um, enrich our learning environment, the sounds that we hear with our ears, a naturally green institution responds to the needs of our eyes, responds to the call of the ears, the sense of taste, the sense of smell, the sense of touch, all our five senses, all our five senses get awakened in a natural environment. That's why in my green school, it, I believe that uh, when our children, young men and women come to our institutions of learning, their senses must awaken. And the more awakened their senses are, the higher is the range of life. The, the broader is the range of the life the more sensitive they become, sensitive to the sights that the eyes see, sensitive to the sounds that the, that the ears hear, and sensitive to the smell, sensitive to all the objects that, that make our institution what it is. So we have to regenerate our institutions of learning to become much more, much more worthwhile, much more fulfilling, and much more meaningful regenerate our connections with our society. That's my second element, a second level of consciousness. Then of course, culture, regenerating, regenerating a connection with our cultural moorings. Dr. David talked about the culture, the culture that defined the relationship between those um, Samoan Islanders and um, Mother Nature, see how rich life becomes. So culture, society, our mind, our studies, aesthetics, spirituality, and ethics. These are the eight important elements of my green school. And um, these can also be seen as um, the eight levels of consciousness. If we are conscious of the need to regenerate, to cultivate these eight levels of consciousness, I feel that um, our educational experiences our children's educational experiences will be all a lot more meaningful, a lot more fulfilling, and a lot more worthwhile. I feel that um, we have to actually make possible and welcome a new awakening, 
a new enlightenment, a renaissance, as it were, of education. What is happening, what has happened so far is good, but it's not good enough. I do not want to throw the baby with the bath water, see. Education has done so much good in the world. The way we are talking now, see, from all over the world, connected together by this technology, this is also a gift of education, technology, see. However, the human touch, human touch, I feel is deeper and profounder than high touch or high techs. <laughs> That's why even as we sharpen, our, as we enable our men and women, boys and girls to sharpen their brains and skills, it is ever more important uh, to help them build their faith, build their character and build hope. We have to do more than what we have done so far. And education is the most beautifully positioned instrument for change, regeneration, and transformation. I would like to wish all of you, my fellow educators, wherever you are in the world, and look forward to meeting you in uh, Paru in June. But in the meanwhile, in the meanwhile, may you all continue showing the light to the world. Education is about making the world a better place. Education is about helping young people find greater fulfillment and flourishing, not only in their own lives and in the life of their families, but the flourishing of our societies, the flourishing of humanity. If education does not do this, nothing else will. To all of you once again, may you have faith in yourself, confidence in yourself, and may you have faith in the goodness of the world, and of course, in the goodness of our children. They, they deserve better than what we have often been delivering. To all of you once again, I'd like to say what joy it's been to be together in this wonderful journey, like no other journey. Tashi Dili. Thank you so much, Dr. Podium. I'm excited. I don't know how <laughs> everyone is about <laughs> If there's a hope, Bhutan can lead this movement, enlightenment to all of us. You know, Bhutan is the only country actually has written in their constitution, they have to maintain over 70 or 65% up above the country land as forest. So bless Bhutan and they have the wise enlightened kings. And, but the good thing is we can learn and we can all regenerate from our backyard. And, and in last webinar we did, the webinar before, I, I think we did a quick quiz about the self-care level and care to others and care to nature. You know, how, how everyone is sensing that matters to their own life. And one of the feeling, I'm sure this is not, it, it's a truth globally, all the nurturers, teacher are under nourishment, nourished. Everyone's tired. If, if the nurturers are tired, how can we nurture the young generation? And, and a lot of them is because we, our living environment is not regenerated. The food we're putting ourselves is degenerating us. It actually have to take your more life force to consume the junk food you eat than not eating. So the wisdom of nourishment must be introduced to the education system now so that so the teachers can be super healthy and then our children can be healthier. I think with green school vision and regenerated food forest in each schoolyard or back home, we might see some changes very fast. And now I would like to invite Dr. David and he is the, the one that create this healing spot and regenerated spot wherever he can in the classroom, campus, and you know, backyard, I don't know where else he will share with us more. And to, to his way of trying to bring the, the healing, the regeneration in our education system in his own way. Um, welcome, Dr. David. <laughs> Thank you, Doma. And uh, Dr. Padiel, I didn't want you to stop speaking. You, I, could, I could listen to you speak for 
hours and hours and hours. <laughs> so next time, just keep going. I just love it. It's just so good for my yeah. soul. It's so good for all of our souls for someone to speak at a soul level and a former minister of education in, in, in America, you know, I can't imagine our minister of education speaking in this way, having this vision. Like, I mean, Bhutan really is just a, a, a gift to the world for uh, the, the kind of education um, we could have if we if we actually thought hard enough about it. So thank you. And Dr. Craig, um, so wow, delicious. that was a um, so many metaphors in your talk just stood out to me. And there was one slide of yours that just stunned me. And I'm going to start with that. I mean, I, I'd never thought of before sustainability. Would when, when I sustainability is a concept I hear a lot. It's in my consciousness. Um, that's kind of what I know. My friends talk that way. It's part of the lexicon here. But you're right. It just maintains, right? And uh, regeneration has this promise of improving. So I was just in your talk filled with this hope of like, maybe I haven't been aiming high enough. Or maybe we <laughs> haven't been aiming high enough. Maybe we've been in education. We've been aiming just to maintain, just to like, tread water just to keep above water when what would it look like if we you know designed our schools to get better every year to regenerate um, i mean you talked about this monoculture mindset i mean perhaps our mindset is impoverished perhaps the highest aim we have and i'm speaking really for me also like is with sustainability which seems high but i love this 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 gift of this idea of regeneration. I mean, imagine, and I, I know, I know there's young, young teachers uh, in the audience. Imagine, you know, uh, you imagine your career as a regenerative career. So you know that your 30th year teaching, you cannot wait for your 30th year teaching because you are going to be that much better. Your career is going to be that much richer. So it's not that you're just kind of hanging on until the end. You are actually regenerating. So. Craig, thank you for that gift of a, of a of an enhanced metaphor that I find incredibly hopeful. Like perhaps we're stuck in this, you know, impoverished monoculture mindset, and our mindsets are incredibly powerful. We know that. I mean, Dr. Patio, we you talked about culture. Like, what are the what are the values that animate the schools that we're a part of? Um, and perhaps perhaps we're not aiming high enough. And it's 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 stimulating to just think what it could look like. But uh, so I, I, I want to say it's a, such an honor to be here today. I wish I could meet everybody personally, but uh, Dr. Padiel, Doma, and Dr. Craig, it's just a privilege to be on this panel with you and to hopefully build on some of, some of your thoughts and ideas. Um, and, and I'm going to actually start with a, a, a quick story. And, and I, I will, I want to, I want to tie my, my comments to um, the the green school that Dr. Patiel talked about, and particularly kind of the, the spiritual greenery. Uh, but I want to start with a quick story. I had the privilege, uh, for, I don't know how long it was, 10 or 15 years ago, Dr. Patiel, to, to co-facilitate um, a conference with educators in Bhutan. And I forget what it was called, what we called it, but it was essentially around um, the spirituality of teaching. Do you? I don't know if you do remember the title. I don't remember if you know. Wholesome. We, we said reconnecting role and soul. Role and soul, yes, very much. Yes. <laughs> yes. So um, it was several days of, of conversations, of poems, of reflection around essentially a spirituality as a human being and as professionals. Um, and it was, I thought, wonderful, mostly because of Dr. Pauti. <laughs> but we, uh, we, borrowed, we borrowed some of these ideas from Parker Palmer, uh, an American educator. And I just happened the other day, maybe a month ago, very negligently to look in my email and look in my outbox. And my outbox, uh, there was an email that never sent from 12 years ago, right after we did that conference. It was from a Bhutanese attendee. And he said, thank you. That was one of the best professional development experiences I've ever had. Um, which I think says less about me and us and more about the fact that what we did is we simply invited educators into a spiritual space. Um, 
And I think I want to just talk about that a little bit about if we do have this life-giving vision of regeneration of if our schools are going to get better and better every year and if our careers are going to get richer and richer, then I think we need to deliberately design opportunities for us to be to live in that spiritual space and to deepen our connection with with that space and with ourselves and with questions about why we why we entered this profession to begin with. Um, why, as Dr. Patio said, why we're not doing accounting, why we're in this noble sector. Um, reflecting on hard questions too about, um, about hurts, hurts and, and pains and, and um, breakages and healing. Um, so I, I, I wanna talk a little bit about some tools like, and, and have us, I think, what I would wish for these young teachers is they actively design for their own careers and for their schools places and conversations where they can grow spiritually and where their young where their students can grow spiritually. So I'm going to talk about three things really. One about this idea of forgiveness um, and, and how forgiveness might play a role in regeneration. Um, I want to talk, as Dolma mentioned, a little bit about this idea of of sacred spaces like could we actually build spaces in our schools um and I, you know perhaps we have them perhaps we have them i'm guessing we do have them um where we could um nurture that spiritual side of teachers and of students so i'm going to talk a little bit about that and it's and uh, maybe offer a challenge to the to the group or an invitation and then if we have a minute uh, i'd like to talk a little bit about um about actually youth apprenticeships, which may sound very strange, but I think it's I think it actually fits here because I do feel like where there's a where there's a breakage sometimes for for young people is when they leave our care of schools and they go into the work world. Um, I think I think there's a breakage there, and I, and I want to just talk briefly about this idea of youth apprenticeships. And Craig, you and I have talked about this about how youth apprenticeships might be a way to to bridge um, a young person into young adulthood. Because um, I think if, if, our, if our theme is regeneration and, and wholeness, and I think that's the image that both of you talked about, which is beautiful, then I think these tools might be relevant. And I, I, I maybe first wanted to talk about uh, forgiveness. Um, as Dr. Patio mentioned, um, for, for many years I worked with schools around their building their school culture and a school a good school culture is built around values core values um, and often it's compassion and it's kindness um, but I, I wanted to make a little bit of a case that forgiveness might be a, a value we should consider um, and I guess just just so we have a starting place um, I guess I would conceive of forgiveness as S simply replacing resentment with goodwill towards someone who has hurt you deeply. So again, replacing resentment with goodwill towards someone who has hurt you deeply. Um, so I guess what's noteworthy about that is there's the, there's no necessary religious connotation to it. Um, I think it could it could actually work, so to speak, in a public school, a private school, a religious school, or not. Um, and I would say it's it's relevant for students and teachers in, in, in the following way. It is simply part part of being human is getting is being hurt. Uh, nobody makes it through their life, nobody makes it through the week without a hurt, sometimes a deep hurt. Um, and what would it mean if young people were exposed just to the idea of forgiveness and actually developed a bit of a capacity? to forgive and knew that it was a tool available to them. Um, not like you, I don't wanna be so simplistic to think you can simply, you know, turn on a switch and forgive. It's, it's much more difficult than that. It may be one of the hardest things we do as humans, but it is, I do feel like I, be, I became convinced through, you know, really conversations with people that know forgiveness much better than I do, that there are things we can do as human beings that make it more likely that we will be able to actually forgive. We can we can till the soil, as, as Craig might say, we can develop the soil in a way that we don't know, we no longer have to be trapped by resentment and hatred. Um, and that we can make it more likely that, and I think there's some grace to it, frankly, like, I don't think you can put on your calendar the next Thursday, you're going to for, forgive your 
your mother or your father, but I think there's things you could actually do to make it more likely. So what would it look like if young people were equipped with the knowledge that this tool was actually accessible to them? Um, I just wanna throw that out there, that I think, I think it actually could, could have value, not, and I, I think, you know, in Bhutan, um, I, I remember I did talk briefly with some people in Bhutan about the values, and, and I remember there were many values they were promoting, and, and I, I think I tried to make the point that compassion should be your main, <laughs> main value. It is, I think it is the main value, um, but I think forgiveness might be worth considering as, as well, and I'd be happy to talk to people off, offline about some maybe research about how you know, the steps people could go through or, or how we actually might go about nurturing forgiveness in young people. So that is, I think would be a gift to students, um, but also for teachers. Um, I, 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 teaching is hard work. I mean, I was a teacher for a number of years. I know Dr. Powdiel has been, it's, it is hard work. We are exposing ourselves every day. Um, it sometimes feels like one against 30 and it is difficult to make it through the week or the year without some deep hurts. Um, so I think one of the, one of the gifts that I feel like we gave Dr. Paladiel those teachers 14 years ago was some space where they could reflect on some of the pains that they've experienced as, a, as an educator. Because we'd be lying to you if we said there won't be pains and you won't, and there may be times you're actually hurt. But what I would wish for you as well is that, that you feel what is available to you or is, is, is a tool of forgiveness. Um, that again, does not mean you're excusing what happened, but it means you no longer are choosing to be burdened by anger and resentment. Um, and I, and, uh, and you know, I guess in the, in the language of regeneration, when a, when a, when a relationship has, has ruptured, forgiveness provides an opportunity to regenerate that relationship, um, I think in very powerful ways. So both for students and for teachers, I feel like it's a concept that deserves um, deeper, perhaps appreciation. So that's forgiveness. Um, um, and I would invite, there are not many books, there are not many kids books on forgiveness. I tried to write one and it was terrible. Um, I would invite, <laughs> it really was, it was very bad. Um, but I would invite, I would invite you all to consider what would a children's book look like that, that nurtured forgiveness? It would be a gift to the world if somebody watching this webinar could, could write one that's better than mine, and I'm sure you, you could. Um, but then I also wanna talk about, um, as Doma mentioned, this idea of a, of a sacred space. And I'll again, tell a, just a quick story. Um, there was a, seems almost daily, honestly, there's a shooting, a mass shooting in schools in somewhere in America. It is, it is mind boggling, um, I, you know, I don't think you're burdened with this in Bhutan, I'm, and it's very possible it's never happened in Bhutan, and, and, and I hope it never does. But after a school shooting, a group of students decided there was, there was a lot of press there, a lot of cameras there. A group of students decided they didn't want to be around the press, and they wanted their own space. They wanted their own space to grieve, and they wanted to make their own space to process what happened. Um, so they created really kind of a safe space where it was just young people and they could talk and process and grieve. And, um, and it, it led me to think that, I wonder if, if, you know, if we actually could help young people create these spaces in many schools um, that are not just where you go when you're grieving a, a mass shooting, but where you actually might go when you wanna reflect, when you wanna pray, when you want to, um, uh, think deeply when you want to meditate, when you want to be sad, when you want to be by yourself, when you want to possibly connect with nature. Um, and wouldn't it actually be nice if there were a place that that same place that teachers could go? Again, particularly maybe after a very difficult day um, in, in the classroom and you're just leaving not feeling very good about things, if there was actually a place that is, you know, and I would... <laughs> I would trust Dr. Craig to be one to put one together, you know, with his knowledge of nature. I, I think, you know, there was clearly would be a bit of a natural space um, where people could go, like I said, for the purpose of, of reflecting, of thinking deeply, of whatever needs to, they need to do to feel more whole. And I, I guess a question I would ask the people on the webinar is, is there, 
place like that in your school now? And there might well be. And if there's not, then I, I think you might, you might be worth talking to some students about creating one. Um, and they, the students could be the ones to take the leadership on that and they could be the ones to protect it. And it could be an honor if the, maybe the, 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 the level, I forget the class levels, but the, the highest level at your schools might be the ones to, you know, protect it and nurture it and um, feed it and maybe teach the younger people how to use it. Um, again, I, I feel like that's the kind of uh, invitation into a spiritual life that, that young people, I believe, are hungry for in the same way that those teachers are hungry for. Um, so that's, and I, I could imagine, and possibly something that could come from this is we could, we could share pictures once, if people do develop these spaces, we could share pictures internationally about what they look like at your school. And you could talk a little bit about what they look like. I think that would be, uh, lovely. Um, and then shifting, um, perhaps awkwardly <laughs> to, uh, to this idea of what happens to young people if we do our job well and we nurture them at the school level, what happens when they leave our care? I think that is another place when they're 16, 17, 18 years old, when they leave our care and go into the world of work for many of them. Um, I think that's a place where many young people get lost and where there is a again, a kind of a, a breakage. And that's where um, I wanna just mention the, the idea of a youth apprenticeship, which is something that I know a number of countries around the world, including near Bhutan, although I don't think Bhutan yet, um, have embraced and we, you know, we stole the idea from Switzerland. Um, this is the nonprofit where I now work for the last six or seven years. We went to Switzerland where they train education leaders and business leaders so actually, how do you develop a youth apprenticeship model so that young people are learning? Let's imagine somebody wanted to learn about nature and regeneration, and they had an opportunity to, to be apprenticed by Dr. Craig. Can you even imagine that? I mean, what a gift. Or let's imagine somebody was interested in educational um, administration, and they, they could apprentice with Dr. Powdiel. Or somebody was interested in running a nonprofit and they could apprentice with Dolma. Um, what a lovely transition from high school into the working world that would be. Now, those are extreme examples that I think, you know, we can't promise every young person. But in the work that I've done at the work at the nonprofit where I now work, it often does work. And when it works, it, 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 when it works well, it works really well. Um, and what it is, the students spend about half their time at school and half their time working with a, somebody like a Dr. Craig. Um, they get paid um, and they learn the craft. It is, it is the oldest way to learn. Yeah. And it, it, it works on two dimensions, I think. It works on the skill dimension. Um, you, you just simply get better at, at the skill when you learn from an expert. And it works at the human development level. Um, when somebody like a Dolma looks you in the eye and believes in you and wants to help you grow, um, there is no better way to develop as a human being, I would say. Um, so that is kind of a practical, it may be out of the purview of what, of what an individual educator can promote, but I think youth apprenticeships, if we're looking to build, you know, the kind of world that Dr. Patiel mentioned, um, of, of wholeness of where people feel, imagine a world where the work that they do is in alignment with the person that they are. Youth apprenticeships, I think actually could, could offer that possibility. So um, I, am, I am optimistic, uh, again, thanks to uh, Craig, because I'm raising the bar from, from sustainability to regeneration and, um, and I do wonder if if we take seriously a concept of forgiveness, a, a concept of a sacred space, um, and on the more practical level, a bridge between the schooling life and the working life, and youth apprenticeships could be one if that could help us get there. So 
Um, I'll end my talk there and, and I look forward to joining the others in uh, some question and answer. Thank you, Dr. David. Um, that was very inspiring from your uh, experience. I'm sure some young teachers or young people also want to go precision with you. <laughs> uh, life, life is a school in itself. If we aspire as individuals to regenerate read ourselves, my personal experience, you, you naturally lifting anyone who is around you. Um, and I hope the, this conference in Bhutan and, and also the online webinars can, can invite and inspire everyone to start looking life in a more regenerated perspective. And we do have some time left for uh, questions and uh, we encourage everyone can leave questions in the uh, Q&A box. Um, and each of our um, speakers here can um, answer the questions. Uh, I'm Dolman. Did, did yes. you open the QA? Do they have access to it? Um, yes. Done anything yes. yet? Can you try one? Let me see. Dr. David, okay. I must say that the meeting. Okay, yeah. Uh, there's someone, Jambe, who wants to ask a question. Yeah. Um, shall we answer? Answer live? Yeah. What is the question? I, it's coming. I see. Mm -hmm. Dr. Padio, uh, sorry, can you continue? What did you say? No, no, I was just saying, you know, Dr. David, uh, you know, meeting you and, uh, and, you know, being on this journey with you has been one of the most fulfilling aspects of my, you know, journey as an educator. Thank you so much indeed. As, mm -hmm. as, Thank you. <laughs> yes. Okay. Well. Um, okay. I Maybe saw it's now. a long question. Okay, we have. Yeah, this internet was a limit. So, why is there a few studies on the effects of chemical on children? Oh. <laughs> okay. Well. Um. That's. If you look at the research on, for example, the effect of glyphosate or, or just the, the, the presence of glyphosate in food and in, in humans, um, they, those papers refer to the fact that there are very few studies. I don't feel like I'm qualified to explain it, but I, I have the impression that in the research world, <clears throat> in the research world, there's just not a lot of funding for that. There's a lot of funding to develop chemicals and to use them in agriculture because there's a big commercial upside to that. But there's not a lot of motivation, I guess. I, I don't really know the answer, but um, again, you, that is cited, mentioned by authors of the studies that do exist. Uh, if you, you do go to a lot of uh, child development and health related conferences international. There are individual researchers from um, holistic health and food system would give you some amazing numbers uh, on the damages we actually are doing to our children just by feeding them so-called food. This is one subject I'm very passionate and I feel that we need food sovereignty education for children. Children should able to deny poisonous food that the school system offering. Um, the, latest, the latest number in US is one of the three children is obesity nowadays. If you look at public school in US, the food is uneatable. And, and I understand Bhutan is buying a lot of chemical grow food from India nowadays. And, and which which to me is very heartbroken because Bhutan has the most beautiful land. The least thing you want to do is dump chemical into the earth. And also 
we, we really need common sense to understand where fertilizer was developed. It was used from leftover Second World War chemical used to go against human. Then the they, they so-called scientists developed the weapon left over and to declare a war using fertilizer against mother nature. And if you have basic medical, uh, uh, tra like traditional medicine view, you would understand the soil is very representing your own digestion system. We have a global digestive system imbalance nowadays in children. Food allergy all come because of GMO food and chemicals. So this should be common sense for all the parents and all educators. If we can't even protect our children's very own physical health. You wanna develop a higher mental intelligence is almost impossible because it's all related. So this is something we will talk more in Bhutan this time in the conference. Thank you for the question. Okay, we have more questions coming from Skara Sen. For use apprenticeships to become part of the learning pathways. And if so, which country would If Switzerland is already doing it and has been for years, I'm half Swiss. Does it have to be started in one school or one, one program or grow from where? And does it get a tackled system wide? So I'm sure this is for David. Um, uh, thank you. Great question. I'm glad it's music to your ears and, and heart. I mean, I. Uh, it was to me too, because frankly, when I was a, an administrator in a school, and at least in, in this country, we just pretend that everybody goes off to college when in fact only like one in only less than one in three one in three Americans has a college degree. Less than one in three, and we just assume they all do. So um I would love to talk to you further about this. I mean, um Switzerland, that's where we learned it from. Um, and they have summer trainings and there are like representatives from Nepal and other countries go there in the summer and kind of learn about it. Um, I, I would love to talk to you offline because I think there would be also all kinds of creative ways you could start it in your own community that doesn't necessarily have to be system wide. I think you honestly just need, you need a framework and you need some businesses that believe that young people can add value and that they have actually, um, um, people working there that would like to nurture young people. Um, so I don't think it has to be, certainly doesn't have to be countrywide. It could be a few schools and some businesses and a framework. Um, and you could go to Switzerland. I'd also be happy to talk to you on the phone tomorrow. I'm not even quite sure where you are, but uh, you know, I'd be I, happy to I share. believe she's from Hawaii, yeah. Hawaii, <laughs> great. Yeah, um, I would love, to, um, I'll, will, they, will they be able to get our contact information or email somehow? Yeah, 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 yeah I'll yeah. link you up, yes. Yeah, yeah, um, maybe we can come to Hawaii next. <laughs> so, <laughs> and also, so I, I would love to continue the conversation, but I will say, yeah, when it works, it works. It doesn't always work, but when it works, it works, it works beautifully well. And people grow in ways that I've just never seen in any other kind of educational intervention. Thank you, David. Um, we have more questions from Sonam Doji. Two questions, is green school for green Bhutan approach Compatible with the idea of regenerative sustainability, regenerative sustainability. Okay. Do you see challenges of leverage regenerative sust sustainability at the global scale? At this seems more of local action. I guess this is for both <laughs> Dr. Podio and Dr. Craig. Maybe Dr. Padia can take number one. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm not so sure where this question has come from. Must be one of my fellow Bhutanese. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, very good. So, um, in fact, uh, as far as compatibility goes, my green school is compatible with anything that is wholesome 
that is um, pure, that is noble, and that is affirming, that affirms life. Life in all its multiple forms, human life, animal life, bird life, Life in the sea, life on land, life in the air, life everywhere in between. So anything that supports life in its multiple variety is green. So when we developed this idea of uh, green schools way back in 2009, we had ho actually hoped that um, my green school would be a means to an end. And the end was supposed to be, and for me, it still is, green Bhutan, green naturally, environmentally, green socially, see, building goodwill, energy, positive energy, solidarity, societal flourishing. See. So building, building, green, building green Bhutan in terms of culture, our vibrant, ancient culture really being a guide, a point of reference to our life. Intellectually green, our young men and women, all of us citizens being open to new ideas, accepting new ways of thinking and living our lives while not rejecting some of the good things that we've inherited over many years. Green in academic terms, academic terms, what do we teach in our schools, in our colleges, universities? We teach these conventional subjects. We have been teaching physics for a thousand years, never asking why do we teach physics? What are those laws of physics that govern our lives, that govern the running of um, our universe? Why is it that somebody decided that, um, that um, the weight of um, the mass of a, a floating substance, the, the water displaced by a floating substance should be equal to the weight of the body is it floating on the water. See? How did that happen? See? Why do we teach literature as, um, as something different from history, for example? What is mathematical about mathematics? So in academic greenery, we are asking these fundamental questions about the nature of these fields of investigation. Why is language different from literature? See? Why, what do we do? What is the purpose of studying literature? See? It must have meaning to our lives. See? Why is history different from geography, for example? See? So in terms of academic greenery, we are engaging with the nature of those disciplines that, that makes learning mathematics fun, that makes learning the sciences fun, see? language and literature fun, see? and uh, that is academic greenery. So if learning has to be meaningful and purposeful, it ought to be a deep engagement with the disciplines. For example, when you're talking about uh, aesthetic greenery, aesthetics, today our children are, and young people are so bogged down, see? so, so, so much, um, so much um, sucked in by technology, the mobile phones, the images on the computer screens, see? so much so that um, they get sick, they get depressed, they live, they live alternate lives. They forget their own sense of identity. And once people forget the sense of their identity, the sense of their integrity, the sense of their individuality, what is left? Nothing. See. And if, if learning leads to this, there is destructive learning. This does not affirm life. This affirms negation of lives. So that's why for me, a green school is an affirmation of all those good things that make life meaningful, worthwhile. Spiritual greenery, Dr. David uh, Fulton talked about, spirituality. Spirituality has got nothing to do with religion or religiosity. Religion often constricts people, see, it puts them in a kind of a, in a kind of a denomination. See. But um, spirituality liberates. It lifts, it uplifts, it liberates. It sets people free. Liberation, spirituality is about recognizing our need for something sublime, for something greater than us, something fuller than us, something more perfect than us. Because as we are, we are not perfect. As we are, we are not false. But in association with something fuller, more complete, 
more perfect. We also become that much fuller, see, that much more complete, see. And is that so there's there's spiritual greenery, see. And ethical or moral greenery has got to do with our ability to make distinctions between categories of values. And what are these values? Right as opposed to something called wrong, good as opposed to something called bad or evil, and uh, truth as opposed to something un called untruth or falsehood or false. Only human beings are able to make these distinctions. And it is this ability to make these distinctions that sets us apart from other, other beings. And today we need good leaders, great leaders for nations, for co communities, for companies, corporations, good leaders who can make a distinction. Okay, this is right, I'm for it. This is wrong, I'm not for it, see. If people have the integrity of character to make these distinctions, we have a good society, we have a good nation. Otherwise, companies fall, nations collapse, societies degenerate if there is no moral or ethical greenery or integrity. See. That's why in my, case, in my scheme of things, a green school is regenerative. A green school affirms all the good things that are important for life and for, for our societies, for our nations, for mother nature and for the world. So it's compatible with everything that is good and wholesome and sublime. Thank you. This is a long answer to a short question. Thank you, Dr. Podium. <laughs> that was a very assuring and inspiring. Um, so you, you remember the Dr. Craig will answer the second part. Oh, well, let's just take a pause. <laughs> 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 it's 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 challenging to speak in the vibration of Dr. Pagyal's beautiful um, answer. Um, and I feel like listening to you, Dr. Pagyal, is like, is like reading fine literature, whereas I'm about to <laughs> scribble on the back of an envelope. Oh, you are <laughs> so very kind and gracious, Dr. Pagyal. I think this is the, uh, the problem with being friends. <laughs> so, Thank you. Uh, okay, I have to actually look at the question again. The question was, is regenerated system scalable or is a local scalable. action? Yes, I, I love that question because it goes back to the idea of as children, when we grow up in, in connection with nature, if we have a food forest near us or somewhere where we can go every day, that's where we develop this connection to observe nature, to interact with nature, to sense the rhythms, and we begin to model in our minds what's happening. And so when you say it seems like more of a local action, it's absolutely a local action. There's no recipe for it. There's no way to plan for it uh, in, in specific terms. Um, and so, what we need, what we really need is to cultivate in, in ourselves and in children and our, our entire community, this ability to, to immerse ourselves in nature and to, and, and to harmonize with nature's regenerative capacity. And only through that process will we have a global effect because if you think about it, the system we have now with all the machines that we use, all the chemicals that we use, all of the um, technology that's involved, that took decades to develop. And so it wasn't an instant change for humanity to, to treat Earth the way we do. It took, we had to build the, the knowledge and the infrastructure in order to do that. So what we're talking about is at the local level, it's hyper-local because what we're talking about is, is actually um, starting with individual action, our own personal actions and interactions with, with our food system. And eventually we will develop a very strong culture, which is stronger hopefully than what, we, what, we, what is existing in, in our commercialized culture to 
which will have a global effect. That, that was what Dormo was saying about 800 million families growing food for us. That will have a global effect. In Samoa, each household has their own food forest. That has a macro effect on, the, on their ecosystem. It has a watershed effect. So yes, I, I, I agree with you that it's, it's a local action, but collectively it's global. It, it has yeah. global effect for yeah. sure. Yeah. Where we are in Hawaii, in Kona, this forest, um, this local forest, actually this forest is about 150 acres that Dr. Craig planted every single seed 30 years ago. In, and it's quite amazing when you think one person can create such a forest and then the food forest it's not too big, actually. It's on half acre land with 20 different patch designs through the course of two years. We have so much food we can never consume. This is where you really feel like rich, abundance, nourish, and then all you want to do is share your food with your neighbors, your good friends. When you have such kind com actions, you know what? You're gonna have a very good, happy, harmonized community. So our own living condition are very much Mother Earth, the second mother we call it in, in the Pacific, is giving us what our physical biological mother cannot give us is all the rest of nourishment you need get. The timber to build your house, the fiber to weave your fabric, the natural dye, the herbs, anything. And that's how our ancestor used to live. What Dr. Craig didn't dive in deep is we actually forgot in the last two, 300 years. That's where we got all brainwashed. It seems the human, like this few generation just totally forgot it. But the good news is we still have parts of human being on earth holding this practice for 4,000 years without breaking it. So we can revisit just like Bhutan, never being invaded. The culture is so holistic. And you go to Bhutan, you can just feel this con continual intergeneration wisdom passing down for thousand years. I remember first time when I listened to talk to Dr. Paulus, a talk about education. He started his speech, that was 2013. And he said, if you all international visitors enjoy Bhutan and like our, our nature, our people, we have to thank our first teacher, Lord Buddha. Guru Rinpoche, who brought Buddhists to us in sixth century. So we, to us, the value, our education foundation for our children, they have to learn how to treat their parents right, the nature right, how to respect all sentient beings. And, and then we teach them the technology, the intellectual development. Otherwise we would not be able to still have this nature. That was so, so deeply imprinted and the same David I was like so impressed I said I've never heard a minister of education of any country start thank you Lord Buddha and I was like wow <laughs> my tear was dropping so today here we are still continuing continually inspired I do think waking up ancient wisdom is important we all have it it's not like we we don't have it. We just need reminder. I think this makes our gathering is so meaningful. And 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 thank you for for, for all your sharing. Yeah. Is there more questions? Sorry, I got excited about the question. <laughs> ask Craig. I'm oh, sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. Craig, I've got a question for you. I would also predict that in Samoa in places where there, where regeneration is actually a live thing and students, it suffuses students, you know, people's lives that I imagine the, the, the deep structure that is visible and invisible in a food forest of, you know, regeneration of um, things working together, of cooperation, of, I, I imagine that seeps into other aspects of the community and the life, right? Like I, I imagine if we want schools where students work together for schools, then, then I would think it would be deeply enhanced by the metaphors and the deep structures that you would find. Are you, do, you, do you find that? 
Absolutely. It's absolutely true. And, and yeah, we could, I could talk for a long time. But this is an area that fascinates me because <coughs> if you, if you simply look at the, the protocols that the Samoans have, that Pacific Islanders have traditionally in indigenous culture, um, they're all they're all about the collective. They're all about gratitude. They're all about um, inclusivity. Um, what I learned early when I, I came to Hawaii in 1988, um, these 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 plants here that the Hawaiians brought, like the breadfruit tree right behind me, that is not a resource to be exploited. That is a relative to be honored. That is our ancestor. That is our family. And so it's, it's what, you're, what you're alluding to is so deeply um, woven into a whole perspective of life and, a whole, and cultural ways of being. So it, it, it reflects in all, in, in all aspects of our uh, lives. In our conference in Bhutan, we have a panel discussion in June is biodiversity, importance of biodiversity and cultural diversity in education. Because many of the challenges, so-called challenges we created collectively is because loss of biodiversity and cultural diversity. And that's what form human beings, societies, communities. And so the, this inclusivity and family unity non-judgment to there in food forest system there's no weed no such thing called weed in past everyone has its role in the nature the way we're treating the nature is exactly how we treat our children we separate them by different names <laughs> levels we define them with on all kinds of diseases we feed them pills not natural food vitamins vitamin pills not real food and we put them in the classroom, not in the nature. Just think about it, the nursery and the classroom. Seeds and children are absolutely mirroring each other. They came with full knowledge, wisdom, and we literally killed them in many ways in the classroom. So this is, this is phenomenal going on globally, but the good news is we can also regenerate them <laughs> very fast. We do have the last poll, and we can uh, share with everyone now and see how everyone feels about our revisioning. Hmm. So do we have the result? We have, a, we have a few. Can you see? I'm not seeing it. Okay, I will. I will. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We'll just go another 30 seconds. Yeah, sure. All right, let's see. What do you feel is the highest purpose of education? One of the choices. Inspire creativity, <laughs> the highest is to nurture children to their full potential and develop social emotional skills, cultivating. It's 10 o'clock. To raise, to raise responsible Earth citizens. This is a, a shared vision of everyone do you feel like 
Let all this new stuff in and gone. Screw. Um, yeah, okay. The second one. Do you feel you are fulfilling your higher purpose based on the education you see? Yes. Wow, we got a very good crowd today. <laughs> <laughs> There's a hope. <laughs> hmm. So uh, if um, there's um Dilma, uh, before yes. we close, can I quickly ask Dr. David if he has a skill to measure forgiveness? And uh, yes, if he has, if he's, you could share. Yeah. Uh, because um, I could use this uh, in the collaborative action research project that we are uh, conducting at the college here, trying to help uh, prospective uh, teachers uh, develop uh, compassion and caring mm -hmm. nature. Mm -hmm. So forgiveness would be a good uh, aspect yeah. of this uh, project yeah. that I'm carrying out. I'd love to talk to you further. I didn't develop one, but um, I believe there is uh, Dr. Enright who I studied with. I believe he has a scale. So happy to talk with you offline about that. Yeah, Thank I'll you. connect you two with email. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. okay. Did we get one more question? Okay. <laughs> That's <laughs> blessing from our friends in Hawaii. So um, then Thank you, everyone, and we're right on time. And um, may the blessing from everyone today nurture the seeds in our heart, in our mind, deep consciousness. May we collectively bring more light, nourishment uh, to the world, to our children. And I'm looking forward to meet everyone in Bhutan. And uh, thank you very much. And thank you, Gisang, Megan, and Dr. David, Dr. Paul, Dr. Craig. I'm sure our journey will keep collaborating and continue. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. And working together with all of you. All the very best. Thank you so much. Thank you, all the teachers you. who come on today. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Dolma. Yes, uh, Dr. David. Yeah. Thank you so much.